Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, episode 5, The Great Migration. About 30 generations ago, a canoe race was held in the lagoon of Pikapiku Wafiti in Hawaii. The old chief, Toy, and the other elders of the tribe sat on the slopes of the hill to watch the race. The victors were two young men named Fatonga and Tūrahui. In the pride of their youth, they sailed out of the harbour and into the open sea. Before they could return, a sudden storm arose and swept them out of sight. Toy was smitten with grief. Fautonga was his grandson, and day after day, he kept watch for the return of the canoes, but in vain. When several moons had passed, and it seemed hopeless to watch for the returning sails, Toy prepared himself to set out in search of his grandson in the canoe Te Pai Pai Ki Rarotonga. He reached Pangopango in the Samoan group, where some of the missing people were found, but Fautonga was not among them. The old warrior set out for the far distant country which Kupe had visited so many years before. He called at Rarotonga on his way and then set sail for the southern seas. Missing his objective, he made the Chatham Islands where he stayed for a time. Sails were set once again and he arrived at Aotearoa, landing at Tamaki. His search for his grandson had proved fruitless, and at last the old man, wearied and disheartened by his long voyaging, decided to settle in the new country. He made his home at Fakatane, far from his own people, his only neighbours being the Tangata Whenua, the people of the land. Instead of the kumara and other foods he was accustomed to, he had to depend on the products of the forest and on fern root, varied only by dishes of fish and fowl. It was here he earned his name Toi Kai Rako, Toi the Wood Eater. In the meantime, Fatonga had arrived at Rangiatea in Hawaii. He had found his way home again, only to learn that his grandfather had left in search of him. He determined to find Toy, and in the canoe Kurahupo, he set sail with a crew of 60 men and several women. He landed at Taunga Purutu, and there he heard of Toi Kairako, who lived at Fakatane on the other side of the island. So he sailed north again, rounded the North Cape, and landed at Makutu. With great rejoicing, Toy greeted his grandson in a pa Maioro a village with earthwork defences called Kapu Tirangi on a hill overlooking the present Fakatane. There, after so long a separation, grandfather and grandson were at last united. Eventually, Fatonga moved to Mahia, and in his old age, his two sons, Tara and Totoki, settled at Wellington Harbour, which was named Tafanganui Atara, the Great Harbour of Tara. While Fatonga was searching for his grandfather, Two chiefs in Hawaii named Nuku and Manaia were at war. Manaia, being the weaker of the two, made his escape on the Tokumaru canoe. Nuku and his people pursued the vanquished chief in the three canoes to Huwama, Waimate, and Tangiapakura. Both Manaia and Nuku touched at Rarotonga and then came on to Aotearoa. Manaia passed through the straits and landed at Rangitoto, Durval Island. When Nuku arrived, Manaya had gone, but the ashes of his campfire were still warm. The chase continued until Manaya was sighted at Pukirua, a few miles from Wellington. A terrible fight ensued until darkness fell, and then friendly night hid the warriors from sight. The two chiefs then agreed to land in peace and take up arms against each other the next day. They went ashore at Paikakariki, but all that night, a fierce gale blew, and the heavy ocean rollers thundered against the shore. This storm was caused by the magic of Manaya. The gale was so fierce that it formed all the sand dunes from Paikakariki to Utaki. The fighting strength of Nuku was broken by the storm, so peace was declared, and he returned to Hawaii. But Manaya remained in Aotearoa. These stories are the beginning of what would become the Great Migration. Many years later, fierce wars had broken out in the tropic islands. Overpopulation and shortage of food were the principal cause. For these, and other reasons, a brave company of people set sail over the trackless ocean. The grey rollers of this ocean beckoned the hardy seafarers. The canoes moved restlessly as their triangular sails were hoisted, and cries of lamentation and farewell rose above the sighing of the trade winds in the palms. It was farewell, 
Farewell to Hawaii the Golden, to days in the hot summer sun, to laughter and song and happy memories of the palm-fringed shores of their native land. But it was also farewell to Tu, the war god, who stalked in their midst, whose shadow lay over them. It was farewell to the tropic sun, which could not ripen enough fruit to satisfy their hunger. A sudden hush had fallen. Where the white wavelets lapped the sand stood the grey-haired patriarch, Ho Mai Tafiti. His voice was lifted up in the Poroporoaki, the farewell. Follow not after the god of war in your country of the south. Hold to the deeds of Rongo the peaceful. Haere, haere, haere atura. His voice drifted away into silence. The wind bore away the soft refrain. The waves caressed the canoes as they slid away from the shore. Tarawa led the way, her three sails carrying her swiftly out into the ocean. The other canoes followed, fading one by one into the distance. Frail winged birds that dared the perils of the open sea. Tarawa was first of them all. Tama Takapua, the son of Homai Tafiti, was her captain. He chuckled to himself as Tarawa lifted to the long waves of the ocean. Before leaving, he had asked Natoro, the famous Tonga, to come aboard to perform the sacred rites, which would ensure the protection of the Atua and the ancestral spirits. Natoro had come unsuspecting, bringing Kiaroa, his wife, with him. As soon as they had set foot on the canoe, Tama Takapua had ordered the sails to be raised, and before the Tonga and his wife could protest, they were sailing beyond the reach of the other canoes. This was the reason why Tarawa led the other canoes out of the harbour. Nataro was furious, but Tama pacified him by telling him that his own canoe would follow quickly, and that he would hold Tarawa back until the other canoes caught up with it. But as Tarawa lifted her head to the waves, and the rigging sang in the breeze, Nataro realised that Tama's words were empty, and that he and his wife would have to remain where they were for the whole of the long voyage. By keeping them with him, Tama hoped to win the favour of the gods, but Nataro was wise in their ways. The Tohunga said nothing, but in his heart, he planned revenge. One day, Nautoro climbed to the roof of the house built on the platform connecting the two canoes, and called aloud to the heavens. His power went out in the waves from the lonely vessel, and the great winds sprang to life from the clear sky. The canoe turned its prow towards Korokoro Terparata, the throat of the sea monster, to the steep descent where the world ends. The waves licked around Tarawa, the sky grew dull and heavy, and the canoe was drawn into the outer spirals of the maelstrom. The carved prow disappeared, the water reached the first bailing place, the second in the middle of the canoe. From his place on the house, Natoro heard the gods splashing in the water and saw the crew grasping the thwarts to save themselves from being thrown out. There was no expression on his carved face, but as one after another of the crew lost his hold on the slippery boards and was drawn into the racing water, he took pity on them and invoked the protection of Tangaroa, god of the sea. There was no hint of fear in Tama's eyes. He looked calmly at the boiling water as if calculating their chance of escape. A storm assuaging incantation came from Natoro's lips. He called upon the spirits of Ruarangi and of Maui to clear from perils all the ocean track of Natoro, and gradually the white throat of Parata closed and the boiling waters calmed down. There were many leagues still to be sailed. Day after day passed by, and every evening the sun was engulfed in the endless sea. Then, the lonely sails were rocked in the black void, and only the sound of the waves, the creaking of the cordage, and the soul of the wind came to the ears of the seafarers. The rising moon shone over the empty wastes, and only the black shape of the following fin broke the silvered surface. After many days, the new land came into sight. As they gilded into the harbour, the water was like glass, reflecting the blazing glory of the flowering Bahutakawa. Vivid crimson flamed on shore and in the water, putting to shame the bright colour of their head ornaments. Immediately, the distant glory of the Bahutakawa was seen. One of the men threw his red head ornaments into the sea, calling out, See there, red ornaments for the head are more plentiful in this country than in Hawaii. I throw my red head ornament into the water. He and the other chiefs were bitterly disappointed when they found that the glowing colour came only from the flowers, 
which withered as soon as they were placed in the hair and crumbled at a touch. The kura, or head ornaments of Hawaii, were made from the red feathers of a bird and worn only by the highest chiefs. Most of the canoes of the migration arrived about this time, and disputes arose between them as to who were the first arrivals. A whale was stranded on the beach, and the captain of each canoe claimed it as his own. It was on this account that the bay received its name, Whangaparaawa, the Bay of the Sperm Whale. The captains tried to decide matters in a friendly fashion. Upon arrival, sacred places had been set up on shore by the different canoes. When they were examined, it was found that the posts set up by the people of Tainui were withered and dried, whilst those of the other canoes were fresh and green. The Tainui, therefore, claimed the whale and the honour of being the first arrival. The people of Tarawa planted the kumara at Whangaparaawa, and there it grows to this day. Shortly afterwards, this canoe separated from the others. 140 men under the chief Taikehu explored the northwestern coastline. Tarawa then sailed to Motiti, which was named after a place in Hawaii on account of the shortage of firewood there, and later to Makatu. There, the people set up their altar, which they named in remembrance of their ancient home. There are rocks at Makatu, which are pointed out as the bow and stern anchors of Tarawa. The stern anchor, Tuterangi Haruru, is a solid outcrop, to which the stern line was probably tied. The descendants of Tama peopled the hot lakes region, those of Natoro, Lake Taupo, and so it is said of Tarawa that the bow piece is Makatu, and the stern piece, Tongarero. Natoro travelled about the country, and when he found dry valleys, he stamped on the earth and brought forth springs of water. He visited the mountains and peopled them with Patu Paarehe, fairies. He was making up for lost time, for when Tarawa was beached at Makatu, his duties as Tonga prevented him from selecting land for himself, while other chiefs made their choice. He feared that all the best land might be taken, but his slave told him of a high, snow-capped mountain from the summit of which, if he could only reach it, he might survey a large part of the island, and thus secure a larger share of the land than other chiefs. Natoro saw the wisdom of his slave's suggestion. As soon as his duties were over, he set off in company with the slave and a favourite dog, for the summit of Mount Tongarero. They struggled up the steep sides and at last stood on the summit, their breath going up like steam in the cold air. As Natoro looked around him, he claimed all the land he could see for himself and his descendants. But in order to establish a claim, he had to give names to every hill, valley and forest. He named them without hesitation. Some of them after the places he remembered in his homeland, others on account of their appearance or of some incident that had happened as he travelled over them. He came to the end. He looked down and saw his slave lying stiff and cold in the snow. He had frozen to death on the cold mountain peak. As he bent over him, Natoro felt his own limbs growing stiff. It was an effort to breathe in the thin air and the cold cut him like a knife. He moved over to his dog and clutched the thick fur, and bade it to carry him down the mountain. The dog struggled to its feet, and began to crawl down the mountainside, dragging its master with it. But gradually, its steps grew slower. Natoro urged it on, but at last, the dog fell to the ground, frozen to death. The tohunga felt the icy numbness that comes before death. It was creeping up his body. Knowing that he'd never be able to get down to the warmer lowlands unaided, Natoro called upon his sisters in far-off Hawaii to come to his aid. Across the sea, they heard their brother's voice, and snatching a blazing brand from the sacred fire, they plunged into the sea. They swam under the water until they reached the Bay of Plenty, where they came to the surface to find out where they were. The water caught fire as they looked about them, and has continued to burn ever since on the spot known to us today as White Island. They dived again, and their underground course is marked by the hot springs of the Rotorua and Taupo districts. Finally, they reached Tongarero, and with the warmth of their bodies, they brought Natoro back to the life that was slipping away from him. Back at Makatu, Tama was dissatisfied and restless. He went further north to Tauranga, where he found Taikehu, but his restless spirit drove him on to Moehu and Hauraki. It was at Cape Colville that he finally made his home, and there he died. 
Natoro and his wife had taken up their abode on Motiti Island, but Tama Te Kapua was buried by his sons on the forested ridge of Moeho. He was left in peace there, for his relatives went back to Makatu. His sons said of him, when they buried him, Let him slumber here, where his spirit can gaze far over the ocean and over the land of Aotearoa. And the winds that sweep across the great ocean, they shall ever sing his oriori, his wild lullaby. It was a fitting funeral song for the famous sailor. His memorial is the name Māori has for the cape, Te Muehu o Tama Te Kapua, Tama's windy sleeping place. The Tainui canoe was built after Tarawa. Her history is intertwined with that of Tarawa, for there was bitterness of feeling between the men of the two canoes after Tama Te Kapua's treachery in abducting Nātaro and his wife. Tainui, like Tarawa, was a double canoe, and Hotudoa was her captain. After leaving Whangaparaawa, the Tainui came to Tamaki, where the seafarers landed. They went up the river till they came to the portage. There, they saw seagulls and oyster catchers flying overhead from the west, and surmised that the ocean on the other side of the land could not be far away. In the distance, they saw the silvery gleam of the Manako, and they determined to drag the canoe over land at Otahuhu and launch her again. Other canoes had come to Tamaki as well. The Tokomaru crossed the island first, but the Tainui soon followed, and sailed into the peaceful waters of the Manako. At Waifakarukurupuhanga, between the rivers of Waiho and Piako, the anchor stone of the Tainui can still be seen. It is a large stone, known to tradition as Te Pungapunga. The canoe finally reached Kafir, where it was beached and later buried. The head and stern pieces turned to stone, and can be seen projecting above the ground to this day. Tarawa was burnt by Rumati of the Tainui tribe, thus causing endless strife between the two peoples. The descendants of Tainui settled in the Waikato. Matatua was made of one half of a tree that fell and split into two pieces, and was made into two canoes. Tarawa was her captain, and her final resting place, Fakatane. The Tokomaru rounded the North Cape and came down the west coast as far as the Mohakatino River in Taranaki. Little is known of the Kurahopo canoe, the Napuhi of the north say it was petrified into a reef on the east coast, but the Altair people say it was wrecked and the occupants transferred to their own canoe. Of the canoes which did not accompany the great fleet but sailed about the same time, the Altair, commanded by Turi, sailed from Hawaii but did not call at Rarotonga. Instead, she was beached at Rangitahua, Sunday Island, where she was refitted and a dog killed to gain the favour of Maru. Rerino also sailed with Aotea, but they quarrelled over Kupe's sailing direction and parted company. Some say that Rerino was lost, others that it was wrecked on Boulder Bank near Nelson. The Aotea gave its name to a small harbour on the west coast where the crew first landed. She was abandoned there. Turi and his men followed the coastline by land until they reached the Patea River, where they settled. Their descendants made their way up the Wanganui River. It is said that Turi brought many valuable plants with him. Five canoes left Hawaii under Tamatea, but only two survived, the Takatimu and Horuruta. A careful choice was made, and only the strongest men and women were selected for the journey. Yet, so great were the hazards of the voyage that three of the canoes were lost on the way. On account of her speed, and with the help of the Tohunga, who called upon the gods of the sea for assistance, the Takatimu was the first to arrive. She landed near the North Cape, but a heavy storm arose and she put to sea again. After rounding the North Cape, she sailed on to Fakatane. A pa was built, and a number of the crew settled there. Tamatea took the canoe back to the Bay of Islands where about one quarter of his followers were left. Setting out again, he came to Waiapu, where he found others who had sailed in the Hororuta. Still more of his people were left at Waiapu, but the restless Tamatea pushed off and visited the South Island, staying a while and then journeying northwards to Wanganui, ascending the river and travelling over to Taupo and Fakatane. Another tradition says the Takatimu was petrified into a range of mountains in Otago. So the country was settled, 
Descendants of Tarawa and Matatua voyagers settled in different parts of the Bay of Plenty, those of Tainui in the Waikato, those of Aotea and Taranaki, while the descendants of the pioneering Takatimu and Horuruta sailors are to be found in the East Coast and East Cape districts. And not long after this came isolation. For many a generation, there were none who dared pass the throat of the sea monster, until pale-skinned mariners sailed into these forgotten seas heralding the advent of the Pākehā to the land of the Māori. Tanakwe, thank you for listening to this dramatic retelling of the Great Migration. This one, as you may have noticed, doesn't have any sound effects, which I was going to do. The reason I didn't is that the narrative, as you also may have noticed, isn't quite as linear and jumps around a bit more than the coupe story, so I thought it would be a bit jarring to have to change scenes a lot. Overall, I've really enjoyed this story. My favourite character was easily Natoro, the Tainui priest that gets shafted by Tama, captain of Tarawa, which I mentioned last time. He is just such an interesting character. He creates a massive storm to take revenge on Tama, indicating his great power, before feeling bad about killing a whole bunch of people because he was pissed off at one guy. Then, when he gets a chance, he just climbs a mountain and does a Mufasa on all the land around him. But of course, you gotta name everything. I just got this image of him up there pointing to stuff and naming it as his slave whinges that it's getting a bit chilly. I thought the part where his sisters somehow just swim over was kind of oddly hilarious, since it had been this big mission that took weeks and many waka for all these people to say to Aotearoa, but Nātoro's sisters can just Aquaman their way over in a few minutes. Now before I get some of you writing in about me making jokes about this, I'm not trying to be offensive, it's just a bit of fun. We can't always take history too seriously, sometimes it is just funny. This story also has a lot more of how the New Zealand landscape came to be, which I thought was also really cool. Anyway, I'd love to hear what you thought of it, what you liked and what you thought I could improve. It should be noted as well that this is one telling of this story and you may have heard it differently. This is by no means a definitive version. Next week, we'll get off these waka and talk about what Māori were doing to survive once they arrived in an unfamiliar land. We will brush over generally how they lived, which will give us a good footing for some of the more deep dives into various topics. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can reach me through email at historyaltearoa at gmail.com, or Twitter at historyaltearoa, or Facebook at History Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A R-O-A. It would also be great if you could give us a rating on iTunes. Special shout out to the guy in Adelaide who gave me my first five star review. Haritu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time.